welcome to Health Hope. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. I'm Gail McKenzie, I'm your host. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Holly Martz. She is a doctor of internal medicine from Skyline Medical Center. Today her topic is hormones and menopause. I'm really glad that she could be with us to share this very important subject. So thank you again for joining us. Hi, I'm Dr. Holly Martz, and I'd like to talk to you about the subject of hormone replacement therapy, or HRT as it's often called, for postmenopausal women. So if you've gone through menopause, are nearing menopause, or simply know someone who is, then this program is for you. You may have heard conflicting stories about hormone replacement therapy over the years, just like I did. Let's go back to the year 2000. Estrogen was said to prevent heart disease, dementia, and so much more. It was loved for its ability to protect the bones and reduce a woman's risk of developing osteoporosis after menopause. Hormone replacement therapy was said to be good for every woman. Then in 2003, the pendulum swung in the opposite direction, and hormone replacement therapy was blamed for breast cancer, heart disease, stroke, and dementia. I can tell you from personal experience that doctors were then advised to prescribe only the lowest possible dose of hormones for the shortest possible duration. Are you as confused yet as I was? We'll talk about the big research study that changed the views of many doctors about hormone replacement therapy back in 2003, but first, I'd like to talk about the hormones themselves. Let's start with estrogen. Specifically, let's talk about the possible signs and symptoms of estrogen deficiency. Women who go through menopause experience estrogen deficiency in every case. But the severity of the symptoms and the duration of these symptoms vary from one woman to another. These symptoms may include hot flashes and night sweats, vaginal dryness, pain or bleeding, memory loss or mental fogginess as some women call it, headaches, weight gain, trouble sleeping, mood changes, skin or breast changes due to thinning of the skin or less elasticity. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Other signs of estrogen deficiency may include bone loss or osteoporosis and more frequent bladder infections. Now that we've talked about the possible signs of estrogen deficiency, let's talk about the estrogen itself. Many of my patients are surprised to learn that they have more than one kind of estrogen. Doctors label them numerically. We call estrone E1, estradiol E2, and estriol E3. The first two estrogens are more aggressive. They help with hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, and also keep the bones strong. If a woman still has her uterus and takes E1 or E2 without also taking progesterone, these estrogens will thicken the lining of her uterus and increase her risk of developing uterine cancer. These estrogens will not increase her risk of uterine cancer if she also takes progesterone with them. The third estrogen, E3 or estriol, is a personal favorite of mine. It's less aggressive and helps to balance the effects of E1 and E2. E3 is helpful for the memory and skin, but it also helps with hot flashes and night sweats. It may even have an anti-cancer effect. Higher levels of E3 have been associated with a lower breast cancer risk. What about progesterone? This is a very special hormone. First, it stabilizes the uterine lining and lightens periods. It's sometimes called a feel-good hormone because it may actually improve mood in some women. It's a natural sedative, which helps with the insomnia that many menopausal women experience. Progesterone is also a natural diuretic and can help to balance the fluid retention that estrogen may cause. As far as your bones are concerned, progesterone may help to rebuild bone whereas estrogen is only famous for preventing bone loss. Now that you know more about estrogen and progesterone, let's talk about some of the commonly prescribed hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, regimens. For women who've had a hysterectomy, estrogen is usually given alone via a pill, patch, gel, or shot. In women who still have their uterus, they're given estrogen plus progesterone in some form to balance the estrogen's effect on the growth of the uterine lining. We'll talk more about the different kinds of progesterone later. 
Now let's talk about Premarin and PremPro, because you'll need to understand what these brand name hormone products contain in order to understand that big research study that caused much of the controversy about hormone therapy. Premarin is a collection of estrogens obtained from the urine of pregnant horses. For some reason, pregnant horses have a dozen different types of estrogen, and only one of these many estrogens is similar in structure to one of our three estrogens. The estrogen we share is estrone, or E1. PremPro is a combination of Premarin plus Provera, which is an artificial progesterone, or progestin. Progestin means progesterone-like. PremPro is typically only given to women who still have their uterus in order to prevent uterine cancer from uncontrolled growth of the uterine lining that can be stimulated by the estrogen therapy if the estrogen is used alone in these patients. Let's talk more about the artificial progesterone, or progestin, called Provera, that's often used in women who take estrogen. Progestins have a different chemical structure than natural progesterone, and so the benefits and side effects are different. Possible negative effects of progestins include blood clots, mood changes, headaches, bloating, acne, or extra hair growth in the wrong places. Provera, in particular, may cause chest pain and has been shown to cause coronary artery constriction, or tightening, in monkeys. For these reasons, artificial progestins are not allowed to be used during pregnancy. Obstetricians know that they should only use natural progesterone in their pregnant patients. Next, I'd like to talk to you about two other hormone products I get asked about frequently by my patients. First, women want to know what I think about over-the-counter hormones. Most of these are soy products containing phytoestrogens from plants. Because you can get them without a prescription, they're not very strong. Although they may have some estrogen-like effects, they're actually a thousand times weaker than our own estrogen. Many of my patients also want to know about bioidentical hormones. This is a buzzword these days. What does it mean? The word bioidentical is used to describe hormones that have the same exact chemical structure as the hormones you naturally have in your own body. These are human hormones that are created chemically from soy products. They're prescription only, unlike the phytoestrogens, the weaker phytoestrogens that you can get over the counter. For some, the word bioidentical may also mean a hormone product that contains a balance of the three kinds of estrogens that are natural to the human female the E1 and E2 and E3 that we talked about earlier. Does chemical structure really matter? Think back to high school chemistry and biology. Even minor changes in chemical structure can result in very different physiological effects at the cellular level. Once the chemical structure of a hormone has been changed, it may have different risks, side effects, and benefits, as we talked about with the Provera. I personally would choose a hormone with the same chemical structure that my creator made, rather than a hormone whose structure has been altered by one of my fellow human beings, however well-meaning. So at this point you may be asking, what about all that controversy about hormones? Many of the patients that come to me have already heard rumors that breast cancer can be caused by hormones, so they're afraid of taking hormones of any kind, even if they're living with severe estrogen deficiency symptoms. So where did all this controversy about hormone replacement therapy come from? Let's begin with a look at the headlines. Here's one from July of 2002. Hormone therapy too risky, study says. Increased chance of cancer among long-term effects. Here's one from September of 2002. HRT raises risk of breast cancer. In 2003, we heard estrogen progestin associated with increased risk of stroke and dementia. In 2004, we read, hormone therapy study finds risks outweigh benefits. Fast forward to 2006 and the headlines changed. Women's Health Initiative study updated analysis. No increased risk of breast cancer with estrogen alone. And the next one is hormone replacement therapy, not as bad as many women still, many women think, rather. Do you still wonder why you're confused? Let's take a look at the Women's Health Initiative research study results in more detail. In women who took PremPro, the combination product for women who still had their uterus, 
There were eight more cases of breast cancer per 10,000 women per year. This made big news. But when people talked about breast cancer risk in hormone users, they didn't specify whether the women had taken the combination product Prempro or plain Premarin without the Provera. When the data from the Women's Health Initiative study was first analyzed in 2002, the group of women who took Premarin alone actually had seven fewer cases of breast cancer per 10,000 women per year. But nobody talked about this. When the results of the study first came out in 2002, this reduced rate of breast cancer in the Premarin group wasn't yet statistically significant. In 2002, the hormones were stopped. The original study participants continued to be followed. As time went by, the group of women who had received the estrogen alone during the study finally did prove to have a statistically significant reduction in their risk of breast cancer. Now, if Premarin alone didn't increase the risk of breast cancer, and the combination product Prempro did, then it's logical to assume that it was the Provera component of the Prempro that increased the women's risk of breast cancer. How about heart attacks and strokes? In the PremPro group, there were six more heart attacks and seven more strokes per 10,000 women per year. In the Premarin group, there were five fewer heart attacks but 12 more strokes per 10,000 women per year. The risk of heart disease varied by the age of the woman when the hormone replacement therapy was initiated. In women who started the hormones in their 50s, there was a decrease in heart disease risk. In women who started the hormones in their 70s, there was an increase in heart disease risk. In order to understand why the hormones used in this study may have increased the risk of heart attacks and strokes, you first have to understand the differences between the two routes of estrogen administration. Specifically, there's a big difference between the risk of blood clots with estrogen in pill form and estrogen that's absorbed through the skin instead. Estrogen that's given by mouth increases the risk of blood clots which can mean more blood clots in the legs and lungs, as well as more strokes and heart attacks. When estrogen is given through the skin in patch, gel, or cream form, the risk of blood clots is not increased. It's always safer to take estrogen transdermally or through the skin rather than orally or by mouth in pill form. And I always choose this route in my own patients. The Premarin and Prempro products that were used in the famous Women's Health Initiative study are both pills. This is likely the reason that the increased strokes were seen in this study with both products. Now you might be asking yourself, what about transdermal progesterone or progesterone creams? You may know someone who's taking progesterone in cream form and has reported all sorts of benefits. The reality is that topical progesterone products are not well absorbed into the bloodstream from the skin, unlike the estrogen we talked about earlier. For women who take estrogen and still have their uterus, taking progesterone in cream form doesn't balance the growth effect the estrogen has on their uterine lining, and this would put those women at risk of developing uterine or endometrial cancer from the unopposed estrogen. In women with a uterus, progesterone has to be taken in oral or capsule form. While progesterone does have other benefits besides balancing the effect of estrogen on the uterus, it's technically optional in women who've had a hysterectomy. The good news is that oral progesterone in its natural form doesn't appear to increase the risk of blood clots as oral estrogen does, or like progestin or artificial progesterone therapy can. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, should I take hormone replacement therapy or HRT at all? When my patients ask this question, I always tell them that the decision to take hormone replacement therapy after menopause, even in bioidentical form, is personal. Women who can't take hormone replacement therapy include those with a personal history of breast cancer, although they may be candidates for pure estriol, or E3, instead of the E1 or E2. Women with a family history of breast cancer can still take hormones. This is a question I get often. My mother or my sister had breast cancer, can I take hormones? The answer is yes, as long as you personally have not had breast cancer. Women with a history of blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes can take transdermal estrogen. Remember, that's the estrogen through the skin. But they should never take oral estrogen by mouth. They may take oral estrogen in its natural form, but should never take artificial progesterone or progestin therapy because that can increase the risk of blood clots. 
As far as the benefits go, women with a history of bone loss, postmenopausal insomnia, hot flashes, night sweats, or vaginal dryness will likely benefit from hormone replacement therapy. I really prefer to see my patients with these hormone deficiency symptoms treated with hormone replacement therapy rather than the multiple prescription drugs that are commonly used to treat each symptom separately, such as sleeping pills, osteoporosis medications, and medications for mood changes, as each of these drugs have their own risks. What about testosterone? You may know a woman who's being treated with testosterone. While testosterone has typically been thought of as a male hormone, it's actually necessary for both men and women. It's made mostly in the testes of men and the ovaries of women, with smaller amounts being made in the adrenal glands. Testosterone is the number one anabolic hormone in women. Being an anabolic hormone, it improves bone and muscle growth, stamina and endurance, as well as lean body mass. This hormone can often increase libido or sex drive. I find this to be true in about 50% of my patients. Testosterone can enhance confidence, self-esteem, and a man or woman's sense of well-being and safety. Testosterone improves balance and hand-eye coordination and may also protect against heart disease by reducing plaque in the arteries and increasing nitric oxide, which dilates or opens coronary arteries. Testosterone can also lower LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, or lower blood sugar, or glucose. It can decrease the visceral fat, which is the fat around your organs. More recently, there was even a study that showed that testosterone has the potential to reduce the frequency of migraines in some women. Now let's talk about the normal range of testosterone. In medical school, we're always taught, treat the patient, not the numbers. And this advice becomes especially important when treating patients with testosterone. Most labs use ranges that are designed to detect extremes, such as a testosterone-producing ovarian or adrenal tumor, or a severe testosterone deficiency. The majority of women with symptoms of testosterone deficiency will have levels which are technically in the normal range on that lab slip. And many of these patients will still benefit from the addition of testosterone to their hormone replacement therapy regimen. So who might be at risk of developing a true testosterone deficiency? Those women who've had their ovaries removed surgically. If you enter menopause naturally, your ovaries will continue to make testosterone for you for the rest of your life, even though they stop producing estrogen in significant amounts. On the other hand, a woman's testosterone level usually drops significantly when her ovaries are removed surgically, regardless of her age even though her adrenal glands continue to produce some testosterone. Women who should not take supplemental testosterone include those with a personal history of breast cancer, if the tumor was estrogen receptor positive, since testosterone can be converted to estrogen, and this may increase the risk of her tumor recurring. Other women who shouldn't take testosterone include those with a personal history of a testosterone-producing ovarian cancer, those with severe, untreated obstructive sleep apnea, and those with polycythemia, which is a condition in which the red blood cell count is too high, kind of the opposite of anemia. So if you decide that hormone replacement therapy is right for you, where do you go from here? My first piece of advice is to find a doctor who's not afraid of hormones. Many physicians were biased against the use of hormone replacement therapy after the Women's Health Initiative study results first came out in 2002. The negative results from 2002 were more widely publicized than the positive results that were seen when the data was reevaluated years later in 2006. So you may find many doctors who aren't familiar with the updated positive information. The next thing you should know is that doctors are not routinely taught about the differences between artificial and natural or bioidentical hormones in medical school. So unless your doctor has a special interest in hormone therapy and did the research on their own, they won't be able to give you all of your treatment options. You should also know that no drug company makes a testosterone product for women, or E3, the special estradiol I mentioned earlier, sorry, estriol, rather. Testosterone and estriol, they can only be made by a compound pharmacy, 
and only doctors with a special interest in hormones will know how to prescribe compounded testosterone for women. Lastly, you need to know that in some hormone clinics, the patients don't see physicians regularly, if at all. Find a doctor who will see you personally. Some prescribers will also target hormone levels that are too high, much too high, and aren't safe long term. If you choose a bioidentical hormone gel or a pellet to be implanted in your hip, which is kind of an in thing right now in some of these hormone clinics, please have your levels checked regularly, as absorption can vary dramatically from one woman to another and over time. The dose that may work in 2009 may not work, maybe too much or too little in 2011. Well, that's it. Now that you have the facts about hormone replacement therapy, I hope you'll find it easier to make a decision about hormone replacement therapy that's right for you. Thank you, Dr. Martz. That has been so informative, and I'm sure that our those who have joined us have really learned a lot. I know that I have, but there might still be a few more questions. What happens if I were to have too much estrogen? Well, you could get swelling. Usually the first place you notice this is your rings become tight. This may be called the ring check. Um, in severe cases, you could actually have ankle swelling. Breast soreness is another one. Now, mm -hmm. if you haven't had estrogen for a while and you're starting HRT after you know, going into menopause mm -hmm. a couple years ago, you will get what I call the estrogen shock. You will get oh. breast soreness because you're just not used to the estrogen. I but see. it shouldn't be severe and it shouldn't persist past the first month or two. If it does, that's a sign you're getting too much. Bleeding, that's another one. Women who get too wow. much estrogen and still have their uterus, they can have periods and break through bleeding and they don't like that. Uh -huh. um, headaches, frequent headaches if you have too high of an estrogen and also weepiness or crying for no reason. I see. Now what about one of the other hormones you talked about and that's testosterone. How much of, you know, if we have too much of that, what happens with that? You can definitely get too much of a good thing. If you have too much testosterone, you can get acne, you can get hair growth, you can get hair loss or hair thinning. Wow. That's just if it's mildly elevated over time. Mm -hmm. If you have a severe elevation, you can have your voice deepen or you can start to have feelings of rage. Your personality can change. You can lose your temper, pick fights with people. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a good thing. You don't want to stay that way for So long. I guess not. No, we wouldn't no. want that, would no. we? But now there's another hor hormone that you mentioned, and that's progesterone. What if we have too much of that hormone? It's very rare to get too much progesterone with the products we use. I don't think I've actually ever seen it. Um, but you could feel drunk or dizzy if that were to happen. Um, in milder cases, which I see on occasion, if a woman's very sensitive to it and absorbs more than her peers, mm -hmm. she could feel more sleepy. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Well, thank you so much. I am so glad that you were able to share with us, and I hope that those who have joined in with us um, have a lot more knowledge now about those very things you've talked about, hormones and menopause. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Martz. You're welcome. Are you one of those who just can't seem to face food when you crawl out of bed in the morning? Maybe a quick cup of coffee or tea, a donut, or maybe a sweet roll is your standard daily breakfast. In fact, statistics show that an increasing number of children arrive at school having eaten nothing at all. Astounding, isn't it? Why is it that most people skip breakfast? The most common reasons are they don't have time. They're not hungry in the morning. They want to lose weight they don't realize its importance. But eating breakfast simply makes good sense. Who would ever start out on a trip without any gas in their car? So why should you start your day without the necessary energy supply? A group of scientists spent 10 years studying the effects of eating breakfast. A good breakfast, they concluded, can help both children and adults this way. They're less irritable. They're more efficient. They're more energetic and they have better test scores. How? Breakfast provides a steady source of fuel to the brain, which greatly improves mental function and attention span. Studies have also even linked healthy breakfasts with less chronic disease, increased longevity, better overall health. Unfortunately, many people attempt to compensate for that mid-morning drop in energy by drinking coffee, tea, 
or a caffeinated soda, along with something maybe sweet, a donut, a sweet roll, or other high calorie snack. So, what is a healthy breakfast? A good breakfast will provide at least one third of the day's calories. It's high in fiber and it's rich in vitamins and minerals. You may have heard the wise saying, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. It's good advice. Try starting your day with a whole grain cereal, whole grain bread, and a couple pieces of fresh fruit, and you'll find that your energy level stays high all morning. Cereals, bread, and fruit are your energy foods. Carbohydrates, which are easily converted into glucose, the fuel of your body. If you are eating low fiber and high sugar foods, they quickly pass into the bloodstream, giving you the high, low effect in energy level. A high fiber diet prevents too rapid absorption, ensuring a steady release of nutrients into the bloodstream. Fiber also absorbs water as it moves through the stomach and intestines, preventing constipation. And remember that fiber also plays a crucial role in weight control, heart disease, diabetes, and prevention of cancer. If you are one of those who says you don't have time to eat breakfast, try eating less at night for your evening meal and go to bed early so you can wake up refreshed with time to spare. Begin your day by drinking a glass or two of water and get outside in the fresh air for some active exercise, like a brisk walk. You'll come back after a shower ready for hearty King's breakfast. What more can you ask for? Thanks for listening. This has been a health moment. <music>